changed from 1990 to 2000. And uh, we had an exhibition, it was a celebration, and uh, a lot of these women are networked, they work even today, and uh, I think today all this is not really relevant, I think they have gone beyond this, but uh, these, was, these were some seminal uh, things that happened with a lot of support from many friends, some of whom are here today, uh, to do it. Finally, to come to the city, and I'm going to talk about only my city, <coughs> our city, Mumbai. Um, I grew up in Mumbai. Uh, I grew up on Cup Parade. It didn't look quite like this, but it did have this raised platform where we would walk in the evenings. I was eight years old with my dogs. And some of these bungalows did exist <coughs> even then. Today, of course, we all know this is Cup Parade. So what does this mean? This really means that there is huge, huge change happening in our cities. And uh, we all know that by 2050, we're going to have 65% of our country is going to be urbanized. It's going to be the biggest movement of urban movement in the, that the world has ever, ever seen. This is Mumbai. Of course, all of you know this. I'm not going to elaborate. The only reason I'm showing this is I just want to concentrate first a little bit on the fort area. Um, here's how it was with the fort walls. We are so privileged to live in a city with so much history, uh, which is so a sense of place, a sense of belonging, a sense of time, and hopefully one day a sense of equality as well, which is not there now. Um, but maybe it will come. So, I've chosen just a few restoration projects to run through for the city. Um, the Cathedral School, the St. Thomas <coughs> Cathedral, the Rajabai Tower, the Old Yacht Club, and TCS House. Just running through five projects quickly. But conservation, restoration, re-architecture, retrofitting, these are all words that are interchangeable. And each one of us has to be a conservationist. Every architectural firm, I don't believe, I'm very much against the idea that you can go and do a six month course and then you're a conservationist. And many firms who want to do conservation think that they can't because they don't have that little degree. Every firm, we have 10,000 ASI monuments in India. The government cannot look after them. There is no way. So each one of us has to look up, take on our own responsibility and be conservationists ourselves. So the Old Yacht Club gave birth to the conservation movement of Mumbai because it was, it was uh, handed over as a club, then it became part of the Department of Atomic Energy after independence, and then the, they broke down half the building. And in the 70s, they wanted to break down the other half. People like Shyam Chainani, Cyrus Kazda, all the stalwarts, they fought against breaking down the rest of the building, and that gave birth to the heritage movement in the city, which then led to listing not just of individual buildings, but subsequently of precincts, and then of the unbuilt heritage, whether it's the Maidans, whether it's the caves, whether it's the waterfronts, whether it's the rocks of Hyderabad, Bombay led in many, many ways. So, this was a part of the building that had been broken down completely. Lots of attritions and additions when Muni Baba was there. So of course the point is what you do when half of it is broken down. And this will always be debatable whether you uh, build something new or whether you just finish the building as it was. So that's another debate and that's another controversy which I'm not going to go into. All I know that I was able to restore and complete the building so it didn't look ragged and jagged. And uh, it was a beautiful building because it was the original club. What you call the old yacht club now was actually the sailor's residential portion. And this was the actual club, which had magnificent staircases, a ballroom with wooden floors with springs where you could actually go up and down when you danced. You can see over here, we restored this room with the springing floors and everything. Unfortunately, soon after we finished this, the government did want to make a museum over here. But we had the attack in Mumbai, and then because of its location and the security issues, uh, it has not been open to the public. And I think this is very, very sad, because if our public buildings are not open to the public, we're not going to have a sense of connection with them, and then how are we going to keep them and preserve them? 
The TCS house was uh, bought by TCS. It was the old rally house. And uh, when they bought it, the entire inside had imploded. Uh, I'm not sure whether they thought that I would keep it or, or what I would do with it. But it was made of beautiful malad stone. And immediately uh, I told the management that this is not what we're going to do. Uh, we will keep the perimeter and rebuild. I didn't realize that what I said was very, very difficult to do and had not been done here. But that's what we finally did. We actually protected the outside of the building, the malad stone, the quarries had finished by then. There was no more malad stone coming. We the broke, which was already imploded, went right down to the basement and rebuilt up right from the bottom up. And I remember one day there was a cyclone when we were somewhere in this stage and I was so petrified next morning. I got up early, rushed there. I was imagining the entire building would have imploded down, but it was safe. And uh, we were lucky to get um, very good people to deconstruct it because it was very complicated in that small site, some of you may know, opposite the Deutsche Bank. This is after completion. And the interiors, of course, we had to change, we had to bring in light, we had to bring in uh, modern communication methods, it's their headquarters in many ways, uh, modern staircases, accessibility, disability, fire protection. Uh, we found some old things in the old buildings, like some old uh, doors which we reused, uh, but it was, it was wonderful. So never be afraid to fall apart, because it is an opportunity to rebuild yourself the way you wish you had been all along. The Cathedral Schools was one of my first projects also for seven years. There were three Cathedral Schools and their church, the St. Thomas Cathedral. If a building is not relevant and if it doesn't move with the times, then it's of no value at all. They had to expand, they had to modernize. But we were in a precinct, height control. So those were the challenges. You can see how we had to create a floor within the original great height. So there were a lot of different interesting challenges that we had to do. We found lots of interesting things like uh, a new chapel in one of the floors. Uh, we found uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, stained glass which had been covered up over the years. So restoration conservation is almost like, uh, like a magical sort of uh, added in scale. You don't know what you're going to find next. You can see in conservation, water is always the biggest problem. Interventions of, to introduce toilets and things like that, that's, that's what causes the demolition and the ruin. So this is a, a photograph, I didn't, I'm in the same place. You can see it had been converted into a toilet. We had to bring it back into the corridor, remove all the paint from the stone, make sure the flooring was right and move on. So you can see the columns, how we had to treat them and uh, this is the middle school and now it is it's now become relevant you know there's a question of it ever being broken down so when a building is relevant and used and beloved to the people who use it they will fight for it and they will make sure that it's not broken down but we do realize money is needed and that's another story altogether which we can discuss another time how do we change the rules how do we make sure that it's viable for people who own these old buildings to maintain them. The St. Thomas Cathedral was also part of the, of the cathedral schools. You know, it was a church and then finally it became a cathedral. And uh, the client came, the same group came to me and they said that the roof is leaking. And I remembered a postcard which I'd seen at Philip's Antique which showed it had a pitch roof. But what had happened uh, in 1920 when concrete came into Mumbai and everyone thought they were being very clever, they removed the pitch roof and they put in a concrete roof and that's what was leaking. So again like TCS house I thought I was quite bold, bold and I said oh we put back the old roof and that was a challenge of a different type. We had to find the original kneelers uh, from where the pitch roof came and I was supported by Sandhya Savan, some of you may know her. Who, who, when she died, I think Mumbai lost their best conservation architect. Uh, absolutely amazing young woman, and she was taken away. And it was Sandhya who worked with me uh, on this project. And um, of course, these are the interiors where we, so I, I, you know, I can't go into detail, but um, 
in, in St. Thomas Cathedral did with the UNESCO award. You can see around it. What's nice is it's used by the Cathedral Infant School and the church is used, parts of the church are used by the children. This is very important. That reverential restoration is important, like the Raja Bhai of St. Thomas. But use is not always reverential. We have to be willing in, in New York, in the Western world, in the Christian world, they are able to change churches and have bars and have restaurants and, because they don't want the building to, to disappear. They don't want the building to be broken down. If a building is not used and if a building can't maintain itself, it's going to go. So we have to be broad-minded. We have to be secular and understand how do we maintain these buildings. And the school is doing that. And they allow the church, allow the school to use one, some of the smaller buildings around which are also rebuilt uh, for the little ones. So that's very, very important. And of course the pavements. This has been uh, my god of small projects over many years. This is the pavement outside St. Thomas that uh, we bulldoze people into doing their pavements because as Jane Jacobs said, one of the six most important things in the city is you must be able to walk in it. And we can't walk in ours. And one day I hope we will be able to walk in ours. And the Rajabai clock tower, I have given this talk at the museum. Uh, some of you may have been there. We all know it was very, very challenging because of its height. It's 280 feet tall. And we had to restore it without stopping the clock. And that was the biggest challenge. Uh, we actually built a, a podium at 190 feet so that we could repair all these uh, wooden louvered windows. We could not be taking it up all the way. So we actually created a workshop at this level and did all the repairs there um, for, for that area itself. You can see. You can see the views from here. Here is our Oval Maidan. Um, and you can see, of course, our magnificent city from here. And the guards and the statues of the 24 parts, 24 people from different parts of our state who actually guard the Rajabai Tower. So it was a wonderful experience. There are just a few images of before and after. There were lots of issues here. The stone, the structure, we had to retrofit the structure. Uh, we had to change a lot of the stone. We had to re do major repairs to the roof, uh, the plumbing, water supply, and of course the magnificent, absolutely marvelous main university. All the woodwork had been painted over or polished so dark. And when we removed the players of paint, we saw this wonderful Burmatique, and then we found in the doors actually um, rosewood, which was used with the Burmatique, and everything had just been painted over black. So this is how it is now. I hope all of you will go and have a look at it and see it. So um, that's the Rajabai Tower. Um, this is the second last thing I'm showing you. I'm showing you a street in Mumbai, because I want to show you how I sit Don't look at the Okay. <laughs> I want to show you how a city has changed, how our city has changed from 1990 till today. And the way I'm showing you is four projects which I have done in a continuous piece of land on that road which leads to Phoenix Mills. I think everybody here knows Phoenix Mills. So you can see in this little piece of land the different four different types of projects that I have done, which shows how the city has changed. Uh, one is was the NRK house, which was the first project that we did. Then we came to an old mill over here, and I'll show you what we did there. Then we had to build a new building here, which was part of an old mill, and now we are working on high rise. So, how does an architect work? What do you do? How do you work in a city which is changing all the time? Are you going to be open to ideas? Are you going to be rigid? Are you going to accept as an architect, you can work with the old and you can work with the new? That people have different aspirations, different needs, different wants. 65% of our population is under 30. What is it they want? What do they need? Are we going to understand? <coughs> so the first was a, a, a little crash. It was a crash part of the Kamla Mills, dilapidated buildings. The client came to us and said, Brinda, do you think I should buy this? I said, buy it. We'll do something with it. I'm sure we can. 
So we respected the street. You can see those days, this was 1990. Not a single building had been built on that road, Tantukara. Nothing had been built. It was just with the old mills and beautiful old buildings, which we all know have all gone. And that's another story, many stories to tell. And um, this is what it was. This is what we made. One building, the toilet became the secretary's room. The kitchen became the owner's room. We had little gardens in between. And uh, the wheat go down, uh, storage go down became his workshop. So that's, that's what we did, you know, with this tiny little, tiny little building. We showed, can you imagine what we could have done with all the mill buildings? We can't even imagine. But anyway, the next building was the same, same client came to us. And uh, uh, this is what was existing over there. And uh, I'm sorry, the second, second project we did was part of the Empire Mills. When a client came and he said, I don't want to demolish my mills, but I need to generate income, so I'm going to make it into an educational institution. See what you can do. So, this is what he gave us. Literally, this is what he gave us. And then we decided that what he needed was a fashion studio, classrooms, exhibition spaces, and a cafeteria. Where else can you get space like this? Column-free space, great heights. Can you imagine it kept all this, what we could have done within all these spaces? By the way, this still is standing and it's still used. So this is what we did. We created a street within that huge space. You can see the spaces to the left. And uh, we kept the structure as it was. We kept the cast iron columns. We kept the beautiful knot like trusses. And uh, this was the library space before and after. And this was the, the, the stitching area where the tailoring section of uh, it was a design studio. And this was the design studio itself where we created an independent building. What happened here was, was that so many TV serials began to be shot here that he made so much money from TV serials that he closed down the institute and it became a, I don't know what, became a, a place for a set finally for TV serials. I don't know what it is now. I haven't gone back for a long time. But it shows. So the first building I call uh, where we did re-architecture, where we changed the use. This second project is also re-architecture. The third project was again, so I finished this, I've shown you that building and this, and this was adjoining uh, the Empire Mills again, within the same structure, where our first client, for whom I built the lake sheds, the <coughs> yeah, house, uh, wanted to build uh, a building for he and three clients got together. So instead of building three floors, we built a building which had three sections. So everybody had a ground and one upper. So we were able to give them gardens. We created gardens and terraces on each floor because we were very concerned about the scale those days. Uh, the buildings around were short and not so tall. So we gave one person ground plus two, ground plus two, and ground plus two. So that's how we created uh, the three different uh, different users, users and uh, we made it very green. You can see it's called Brady Gladys, it's still standing and this is actually the first floor garden. So there are many different ways one can approach challenges within the same, same, almost same piece of land. Here it is uh, now with the gardens on each floor. You can see it's the ground floor and the first floor and the second floor. We also tried to bring some sort of roof sculptures because of the chimneys around. We thought we would make it low and relate to what's around it. And now finally, we are doing a very tall building. Uh, we're doing three towers. Here is actually, you can see our site. I've taken this picture from our site. So you can see our little NRK house is still standing over here. You can see the Empire Mills over here. And you can see the Brady Gladys. So this is our city. This is what's happening. This is a huge change that's taking place within our city. And while this is happening, what is happening to our open spaces? You know, wherever there are people, buildings and neighborhoods, uh, people attract to other people. Everyone knows that. You can see this picture over here. But what's happening? Our gated compounds coming. Two problem, problematic things are happening. One, of course, is the gated compounds. But the other thing is this 
horrible disconnection with the street because of eight levels of parking and then the apartments. So there's no connection of anybody with the street. And this is the tragedy because not only does open space disappear, connectivity disappears, and when open spaces are covered with, uh, with uh, compound walls, we don't know what happens within that. So Mumbai is struggling. I don't have to tell you about statistics. We all know that. But each one of us can make a difference. This was a small six acre, four, I think four or five acre plot in Tuff Parade. It was a garbage dump belonging to the PWD. And in 1990, a group of us got together. We got the municipality to give us the land on leaves and we planted trees. And while we were doing that, everybody around would be phoning up and saying, don't plant trees, plant this flower, plant that flower. So finally, I told each one of them, you know, there are lots of garbage dumps in the city. Choose your own garbage dump and decide what you want to do. And we planted the trees today. It's called Kalaba Woods. We know the controversy now because the metro is, is trying to take, take away some of it. We have uh, we created a gazebo for the children in the neighboring area to be able to come there and study at night because they didn't have power those days. Uh, we created a place where older people can walk. We created an amphitheater where talks on drug abuse could happen. What was important here was this park was, did two things. It was typical of Mumbai. On one side, you had Cup Parade with its bungalows and well to do people. On the other side, you had the slums of Mumbai. And when we, op when we opened it, when we finished and we opened it, um, the municipality wanted us to charge two rupees per person to enter. We were a group of trustees and we said no. They said, oh, all the slum children will come and they will spoil it and you have to charge.